morning and welcome to Thinking Tackle. My name's Danny Fairbrass and we're here at Hardwick Lake on the Linear Complex in Oxford. I'm here with my really good mate, Neil Spooner, and he's got loads of fish all over him already. I'm gonna go and get my rods out. I'm gonna hand you over to him and he's gonna to talk to you about where he's put his rods and what he's got on the end. Right, welcome to my swim. Got down here quite late last night with Dan and initially I was gonna go on the other side of the lake. Found this real nice bay, southwesterly pumping in. Um, but luckily I heard a fish on this side. So sat and watched the water for a bit, saw quite a lot of activity, lots of bubbles popping up, and it was clear that there was quite a number of carp in here. However, rather than fishing last night and sort of risking maybe spooking the swim and having nothing left in here for today, I had to do what is, doesn't come natural to me and have carp feeding in front of me, not going to do anything about it. Just sat and watched them, kept feeding them. I mean, all through the night I've had very little sleep. It's probably through excitement. There, there is, a, or certainly were, a lot of fish in here. So every half hour, 45 minutes through the night, I've been getting up in between the rain, just flicking a few bits of bait out, a few tiger nuts, a few boilies, bits of corn, you know, just something that will hopefully keep them grazing around for long periods of time. Uh, and then this morning, once, you, you know, once the camera crew have arrived, I managed to get the rods into position. Um, gone with very, very simple rigs, just, you know, knotless knotted. Um, both hook baits are varying slightly. One's a snowman topped with a little bit of corn because that's what I've been putting out. And the other one is a, is a pair of balanced tiger nuts. Now the left hand rod, is fished probably just over two thirds of the way across. Got a real nice donk down when I cast it out this morning and just with a real high track stick on the end. I'm trying just to hone the carp in. I'm not trying to get them, I've not put loads of bait out on top of it. In fact, I've put nothing out now for about two hours. Um, right hand rod fish very similarly. It's got a little stick on, but it's in much closer, which is why I'm trying to sort of hush my tones a little bit. It's fished probably two rod lengths out, just the other side of this reed bed that you can see. And even as we're, as we're doing this now, the left hand rod, there's there's definitely activity, there's, there's certainly signs that fish are feeding over the top of it now. So now it's just a case of fingers crossed, but I'm pretty sure we'll never fish on the bank soon. The lovely people at Linear have shut a few swims for us. It gets very busy on here, and if we turned up with a camera crew and all the swims were taken, we'd be scuppered. So we've got a few swims on this little spit. We chose this one because the southwesterly wind blows in here, and at the moment it's blowing sort of west-northwest, but it is due to swing round, so it's a bit of a tactical decision. Unfortunately, yesterday when we arrived, there weren't loads of fish out in front of here. They were all in the Smith side, but this is a real hot spot, this swim. It's right at the end of the spit, and the main area is out there at the telegraph pole out there at about 18 rod lengths. So I rung a couple of guys that fish here all the time. They tipped me off with the area. So I went round the marker poles. It's so important to have those sticks in the floor to go round them. Went round them 18 times with a marker rod with just a lead on the end to begin with. Cast it out, felt it down, it crashed down. So I let a bit of line out, cast it a little bit further. It crashed down again. And then I swapped over and put the marker float on to read the depth. And if you cast around out there, if you go too far um, left or right of that telegraph pole, it goes into really deep water and it's much softer and there's a bit of weed. So I'm guessing there's a long, thin bar that runs away from me. And trying to get three rods on that was gonna be difficult. So I opted to just fish two rods out there. And then the right hand rod, I wanted to find something a little bit closer um, and basically something that's shallow as well. Because out here, you've got a lot of deep water and where the shallow spots are is where you get your bites from. So you've got 20 foot all around and then a big hump coming up with sort of 12 or 13 foot. And that's what I've found. At the swim in the copse of trees over there, it's exactly 14 rod lengths and that's again onto another hard area. I've cast around, you can feel as the lead hits the bottom with a marker rod, there's a bit of weed, bit of weed and then crash. It's a real clean area. So my right hand rod's there. I baited up with about 10 or 12 spoms, the big spom. Um, over both areas last night, didn't fish, waiting for our camera crew to arrive this morning. And this morning there was a bit of a slick coming up. And that means the fish are eating the bait because there's some oil in the bait. As the fish chew it, comes up to the top and forms a flat spot. So I knew something was out there eating it. Hadn't seen any carp showing in Spooner's side. They were all over the place, loads of fish showing. So it was obvious there weren't loads of fish here, but there was something feeding. Now. It's probably, what is it now, nearly 12 o'clock. The sun's high in the sky, it's got warm. It doesn't look brilliant for this area, but because we've still got the wind blowing through, I'm seeing the odd flat spot coming up. I've seen a fish's head come out. You know, So even though it doesn't look brilliant, it could still go. And what I'm probably gonna do is give it until this time tomorrow in this swim, see what happens. Tomorrow morning is the key time. The first few hours of daylight in this area at this time of the year is the hot time. And if nothing's happened by then, I'm gonna wind the rods in, have a look around the rest of the lake, 
because when it gets hot, they do get into the real shallow water. You remember last year I was on here with Simon Scott and I caught them right down at the end of Smith. So this is where I'm starting. If the fish aren't here, I'll be having a move. First bite's just come. Not sure if it's a carp or not. But a bite out of the blue in the bay. And as you can see, I've got my waders on just in case, and he's actually going round to the right. Oh, I was just thinking about having a recast. I just saw a few bit of activity round to the right. I was just thinking about a recast, and uh, the rod I most expected, the left hand one, so on a little balanced two, two tiger nuts. Hey, he's beautiful, he's not massive, but it's the first bite. Come on, mate. That's your lot, get in. There we go, 16 pound of stunning Miracop. What a puck away to start. The rod's been in position for about four hours and unbelievably I was about to recast it. I was literally just, I'd, I'd noticed a few more, more and more bubbles coming in closer to me, so I'd cast over them if you like. So I went down to the rods, I was just standing there thinking exactly where I was going to put it and as I did it, the bobbin just pulled up to the top and the rest is history. He put up a really good account of himself but finally went into the net, as I mentioned, 16 pound. What a way to start. A couple of hours have gone by and nothing's happened, but I've had a few single bleeps on the middle rod and I just felt like something was wrong with the rig. Maybe it was laying funny or it was tangled. So I've wound that one in. It was absolutely perfect when I wound it in, checked it. The hook was still sharp and everything. So maybe they were just line bites. But if you feel like you should have caught one and haven't, then it's worth winding in just one rod. I'm not putting any more bait out there. I've changed the rig over to a lead clip, which casts that little bit better. As you can see, we've got a bit of a crosswind at the moment and it's not easy getting two rods really close together but I'm going to put this back out again the right hand spot is slicking up now the fish must be out there and feeding even though the sun's high in the sky and just replacing one rod is minimum disturbance and maybe that's the difference between getting a bite and not really careful not to move the lead so I tighten the line just with the line in my fingertips like that it's very very easy when the lines across the surface to actually pull the lead along the bottom and then what I do is I tighten up the line so that it's pointing directly at the spot where we've got a crosswind here it's very easy with two rods close together for one line to sink over the top of the other line so what I do to begin with is I tighten it up as much as I dare get it pointing straight at the rig and then take the bobbin off, slacken off, and then let the line sink down a little bit. So it's a weird situation, this. We've got a very small spot, a crosswind in deep water, and uh, you've got to be careful that the two lines don't knit themselves together. So that's the rod back out on the spot. I reckon this afternoon something might happen. The, 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 the sort of heat's gone out of the day a little bit, and I reckon when we get to sort of four or five o'clock, um, a feeding spell could start then, and we may get some action. Right, you join me and all hell just broke loose. I was just talking to a lad at the back of the swim. We were commenting all the different areas where there was some fizzing coming up and the left hand rod, same rod as before, absolutely melted. So much so, I'm only fishing halfway across and it actually made its way to those snags on the far side. I was fishing quite a tight clutch as well. Compared to the first bite, we just sort of pulled it up to the top, this was a completely different ball game. Again, I don't think it's a massive fish, but my God, do I know he's got a hook in him. It's been a bit hectic, he's coming in, he's getting in close, but I just feel like he could, he could charge off again at any second. Just carnage, Couldn't, could not stop him. Thankfully turned him just as he actually saw him roll just under the canopy of those trees. There's nothing underneath them, so as he dived down, he sort of came out on a tight line. 
and went right, which is why I'm now in the water. What a scrap though. Another one on the little, little balanced tiger nuts and the caramel flavouring over the top. I can only assume that the fish sort of left the area for most of the morning and to have two bites in relatively quick succession that they've sort of turned, turned up again. After the last fish, I've actually moved my close in rod out at that range as well. I just felt that after disturbance with me walking in and the fish rolling over the top of it the first time round, that spot was almost a waste of time. You know, I'm fishing mega slack lines, keep everything pinned down out of the way. And it's, you know, it's not effective, I've had another bite straight away. They all know exactly where they're going. It's the second fish, they sort of go that way one minute, trying to get in the reeds, then they're over here. Obviously this one tried to get in the snag on the far side as well. He knows his home well. Oh no, it's another puck of scaly mirror. Come on, mate. Ah, oh, get in. Number two, come on. Well, there we go, another scaly mirror. What a result. Yet again, it's come on the balanced tiger nut rig and yet again, it was absolutely nailed. Proper, proper scrap though. Absolute one toner, out of the block straight away. Thankfully, after a bit of a gentle persuasion, we shall say, she graced me net. I'm gonna get it back and as long as I get a bit of breathing space, I'll show you a bit more about the rig. I'm gonna start with the tiger nut end simply because you've heard me mention a couple of times that the, both fish have been caught on balanced tiger nuts. So splitting them apart, as you can see, there's a couple of tiger nuts. Sandwiched in between them is a small piece of cork. Now, in order to get this right, what you use is a, is a small nut drill. Drill about three quarters of the way through each tiger nut, not all the way, it's quite important because then the nut becomes quite weak. And you then insert a carefully cut piece of cork. Push it all back together, like so. And then what will happen, when it's on the bottom, the hook will sit flat and the, the nuts just kind of wave around a bit like so. Just creates like a little, like a small balanced snowman if you like. Okay, moving down to the, the next part which is the all important piece, which is the hook. It's a cross between a wide gape and a curved style. It's also got, if you can see, an offset point as well. Now the beauty of this style of hook, a lot, a lot of the rigs I've used in the past, you tend to add a small piece of shrink tube to the eye and then a small rig ring which will sort of run up and down the shank as well to give that sort of blowback effect. The great thing with this pattern of hook, it just simply needs a knotless knot. The age old classic, the one we all tied when we first went fishing, you can go right back to it and trust me, you won't be let down. I've found perfect with this particular, I'm using a 15 pound tungsten braid here and I've found that a seven turn knotless knot creates that perfect aggressive angle that you can see there. As soon as a carp comes along and tries to move away, you imagine the bait separating, the hook immediately just drops down towards that all important bottom lip. And to, the reason I've chosen this hook, this braid, uh, as I said, it's got tungsten in, and that means it sits over any contours on the lake bottom. Now, when I got into this swim, I wasn't sure what the bottom was like. All I was aware of was the fat carp were present. So rather than having to lead around to find out exactly what I was fishing over to determine exactly what hook link would be best, this will sit over anything. So I could cast it out with extreme confidence. Finally, the last two pieces, I've got an anti-tangle sleeve there, which is also tungsten impregnated as well, just ensures that everything stays pinned down. And then finally, just a small link loop. Now you've probably seen these before. They make it very, very easy to quick change. So once I've got a fish in the net, I can simply unclip the rig, leave the carp sitting there waiting for me to have, you know, waiting to have his photo taken. I can clip a fresh rig on, slide a stick down the length as well. Again, it just helps make sure that nothing gets on the hook point during the cast and then it all gets clipped on and there's a rig back in the spot within it's simply just a couple of minutes. Just meaning that you've got, you know, you can get that next bite that little bit quicker. So there you go, very, very simple. There's nothing over complicated in that at all, but it's certainly been effective today and it seems to be the right choice. We'll see how the rest of the session progresses. We may need to tweak it a bit, but for now, that's gonna be on both rods.
Well, good morning. It's set to be another absolute scorcher today and I just wasn't feeling it around the other side. I did the night, I caught a great big bream in the middle of the night, but there were no fish showing there first thing this morning. I was up really early and uh, I basically used the, the experience of last year and that's a really good point to make that a lot of people come to a lake, don't catch anything and move on to another lake and another lake and another lake. It's always better to keep coming back to the same place, get to know it and then your catch results are going to get better and better. And this time last year it was really hot like this and uh, the fish moved down to this end of the lake and I managed to nab a few from this swim. And coming down in there, another one's just shown out there now, it is black with them out there. Um, I'm going to start off by fishing in the slightly deeper water. Two of the lads down the bank have caught two sort of in the last couple of hours, um, sort of in about 12 feet of water and that's where the fish are showing. But as it gets hotter, the fish will move under the tree over there and they were up and down that bank a lot last year. So I'm going to have two rods over there. The third rod I don't know what I'm going to do with, but I'm going to get the rods out as quickly as I can because there's a chance of a bite. Oh, one has just shown right there, right over where a load of bubbles have come out. They are here in numbers, so I'm going to get the rods out. Well, how about that? 24 hours in the wrong swim, as opposed to 20 minutes in the right swim. Oh, shaking his head there. It's not a monstrous fish. I can feel him really banging his head, which is a sign of a smaller fish. But who cares? It's a bite. And uh, it's come just 20 yards out, straight in front. Exactly the same rigs as I was using in the other swim. The same, the same hook baits as well. And just a little tiny stick the kit I'm using for this sort of fishing is, is pretty sort of standard for everywhere I go. Um, quite a powerful rod, 12 foot, three and three quarter test curve rod, but it's got a lovely battle curve in it. But most importantly, I've got a, a new line on, which has got half the stretch of a normal mono. So feeling the lead down, you'll see when I cast, you can, uh, you can see the donk on the rod tip as the lead hits down. And it's so important to know what it's landing on this is 20 pound line, so it's quite thick, but it's super, super supple. And with a lot of low stretch lines, they snap for no reason. There he is down there, little mirror. Um, they're just prone to being problematic. And this stuff is uh, a lot more forgiving. Okay, I think he's ready. In you come, get in the net. Yes, got him. Wicked. Hopefully the first of many. Well, check that out. They don't need to be big when they're as beautiful as this one. Just over the magical 10 pound barrier, but who cares? And imagine what this is gonna be like when it's 30 pound. They've got a really good forward thinking policy on this complex and they're stocking fish like this. And I reckon this is one of Simon Scott's babies. He's a fish farmer as well as an angler. And this looks very much to me like one of the ones that he's grown on himself. So uh, thank you very much, Simon. We're gonna put him back, see if we can catch another one. Well, what a disappointing night's fishing. Felt more like camping, to be honest. I was so confident after being in here for the first night, hearing all the fish and all the activity without any rods in the water. I thought last night was going to be a case of flicking the rods back onto the spots and just letting everything work its magic. It had to happen. I honestly thought I was going to have multiple bites last night. But then sometimes that comes back and bites you, doesn't it? It wasn't to be. I heard nothing. I sort of crashed out about 11 o'clock, really tired. Up again at 5 o'clock this morning, looking over the spots, and just nothing was happening. It was all a bit, I just, again, started to feel a little bit despondent. I was going to leave it a little while. I was going to have a wander, see if I could find some fish somewhere else and go and, you know, go and try to catch them. However, fate may have played its part because as I was thinking about doing it, I just saw the first in a few patches of bubbles appear and it's like they've turned back up again. I think they left the area and come back in. I've made a few little rig tweaks. 
Um, hopefully they're going to pay off, and if they do, we'll obviously talk you through them later. The rig's now back in position, the bubbles are still peering, day two's looking good, let's see what it brings. Oh my God, just sitting there having a chat, and the freshly recast rod, which I've sort of moved position, it just absolutely tore off, it took me by surprise. Luckily, you know, I was sitting down by my rods anyway, I managed to get it under control. As you can see, I'm already in the water. It went left straight away, as I kind of anticipated them doing. Again, I don't think he's very big, but he was not expecting to be hooked. <laughs> Bubbles have just started to, you know, they're getting more and more frequent. I always think that, I've not put loads of bait out, so I know that, I know they're not gonna be preoccupied for a long amount of time, and it is only a matter of time before they get my hook bait. It's another very pretty scaly mirror. This one's actually come on, a, as you can see, hanging out of his mouth. A little bit of boily. Oh, tipped with yellow corn and he's in. Oh, get in, come on, come on. Well, there we go, fish number three and another absolute perler. They seem to be getting even prettier. Can't wait for fish number four. I made a few little rig changes before getting this bite and in a second, I'm gonna run you through them. Well, here's the rig that I just caught that carp on. And as I mentioned, I have made a few changes. Now, when I first got into the swim, I needed to have a rig that I knew, I cast out wherever it landed it was going to be presented. I didn't know what the bottom was like, the carp were already here feeding, I didn't want to risk spooking them by continually casting around. So I went with a very light lead and a long braided hook link which meant that wherever it landed it could lay over and the carp would be able to pick it up you know, as, as and when they needed to. Now after having quite a few casts now where I've caught a couple of fish and sort of getting the rods ready last night, it's apparent that wherever the leads land I'm getting quite a firm donk on the bottom which means that Whilst I don't think it's quite as hard as gravel, it's almost definitely clay. And that allows me to use one of my favorite hook links. Now I've changed to the stiff coated braided that you can see here, and I've shortened it down by almost half. I started off with about eight to 10 inches yesterday, and this is about four and a half inches here. As you can see, the way it's reacting here, it is very, very stiff. So as soon as it lands, as soon as you cast out with the allowance of the stick on there as well, the lead hits the bottom first, and it just gets pushed away so that it's sort of cocked and ready for action whenever a fish does come along. And that, I'm pretty sure, leads to more bites. When it's coupled with the anti-tangle sleeve, just in case a carp does get away with it, once it's picked it up and, and ejected, it can still push away and be ready to go again. Another important change was the lead system. Now, I, I was using ounce and a half leads yesterday for the reasons I've just mentioned, but now, having felt the donk, having known that it's clay, stroke, gravel, I've been able to go up to a three ounce lead but it's, the, it's on the centre of gravity system too, and I'll show you how that works. If you can imagine a normal leg clip, the fish can pick it up, and in some instances they've been known to, you know, been seen them to use the swivel to actually get the rig out of their mouth. They can't do that with this. Mr. Carp comes along, he picks it up, and as he goes to pull away, the rig obviously straightens, and he's got the full weight of the lead instantly, as you can see there. And trust me, there's pretty much no getting away. Once they've got that, the size six hook, once that's in position in the bottom lip, bang, it's game over for Mr. Carp. Now I noticed another couple of things yesterday as well. When I got the fish feeding close in the edge, I noticed that the, the double hook bait stood out a little bit compared to all of the other items that I was feeding. Now I've been feeding exactly the same stuff in open water as well, sort of a mixture of corn, hemp, pellets, tigers and boilies, but two of those big tiger nuts together just stood out a bit, especially when it was in the edge. So all three rods, they're now fished with exactly this rig, with the four, four and a half to five inches of stiff coated braid, but I've also played around with the hook baits. The tiger nut is still balanced out there, but now it's just down to a sort of a single nut with the cork in the middle of that. I'm pretty sure that's gonna make a difference. The best thing about today, when it started off this morning, it was bright, hot sunshine. The swim looked absolutely devoid of life. I still reset the traps because I started to see a few bubbles start to appear around about seven o'clock this morning. Now, it's nice and overcast. There's a westerly wind absolutely pumping in, and for want of a better phrase, the swim couldn't look more carpy. The traps are set. I'm pretty sure it's just a matter of time before carp number four makes his next mistake. Right, I mentioned yesterday, when the sun got out to its highest point, the far margins became alive with carp, and I was getting chances in the edge. Now, whilst the weather hasn't done the same today, I fancy that the far margin could get a bit of attention. Now yesterday I was being a bit too reactive, I, I got the rig in position once I knew the fish were there. However, it's the day of the proactivity. The rig's been out there now for 
a good few hours and it seems like the carp had just turned up. This one is, again, I, I don't think it's a massive fish, but he knows where he wants to go. He's gone right round to the right, come out from under the tree nice. In fact, I thought it was a bird. There was some coots diving on the spot at the time. But if it is a coot, he's wearing an aqualung because he hasn't surfaced yet. Good job I've got my waders on. Right, he's coming back round. He's gone right round the reeds. But a little bit of steady pressure. He's not, he's not locked up or any stage. And as you can see now, he's actually gone back out into open water. Oh, it's another lovely scaly mirror. I said he might get prettier. It only has. You can see I was already in my waders sort of ready to go. I think it's, it's quite important. If you fish a swim like this, and he's been baking hot, trust me, I've lost about a stone in sweat just sitting in them all day. Well, for two days now. But as soon as the fish could cut, I could just run straight in the water and not worry about it. And the chances are, if I couldn't do that sort of thing, on a couple of the fights I've had, I may well have lost them. Here he comes, here he comes. Go on, baby, kiss the spreader block. Oh. Oh, I thought he'd escape, but we got him in there just. Get in. But there we go, fish number four. And I was right, they are getting prettier somehow. Never seen quite such a stunning stock of sort of heavily plated mirrors. As mentioned, it's come off the new spot, but this time it's caught on a trim down Brazil nut. Happy days. Well, it's all been happening at this end of the lake. Um, I've swapped two rods over to that margin round to my left there because this time last year when I fished in this swim, the fish were in real shallow water and I crept round there and had a look and there were fish moving up and down the margins and it was all smoked up. So I threw a little bit of bait over there, some half boilies and a few tiger nuts and then cast two rods over the top and it was probably about 10 minutes later, the rod absolutely burst into life. It was one that had already been picked up by a coot so it just showed that the rig actually reset itself and um, nearly pulled the rod off the rest and kited out into open water. I went for a load of weed beds and I could feel it grating, grating, grating and it just cut through the line. So uh, properly gutted about that one I was. Um, I've put them back out there again. They've just got little sticks on the end, very short, um, fluorocarbon hook links and size four hooks on a D rig. Um, and uh, I've just put a little bit more bait over the top and I've moved the position of the rod so it's pointing straight at where I'm fishing now. So hopefully I won't have that same problem where they're taking loads of line as the rod's bending in the rest. Um, and this one I've just put out, just make sure I've sunk that properly. There's loads of fish out there on the surface. They were here yesterday afternoon as well. We can't put floaters out and conventionally float a fish because the seagulls just dive bombing. There's about 30 of them here. And they eat all the floaters in two seconds and scare all the carp away. So my only real chance is to catch one that just grabs at the bait that's sitting out there. So it's effectively a zig rig. So I've got an inline lead fish drop off style and then a really long light mono hook link. Uh, this one's about eight pound breaking strain, a size 12 hook and then a little brown um, pop-up that I've cut down to make it look like a chum mixer and that's fished over depth. I cast the marker float out there, let it up to see what depth it was. It's 13 foot, so I've made it sort of 14 and a half, 15 foot. So you've got a little bit more room so it can actually sit on the surface layers of the water. Um, it's very difficult to know if that's fishing well out there. I got caught around a reed on the first cast. There's loads of reeds drifting about. If the, if the hook link goes through a reed, obviously it's not fishing. Um, but we're going to give it sort of an hour. There's loads of fish drifting around out there. And just by fishing an anchored floater like that, it's my best chance of getting a bite off the top. I'd love to be feeding, and I think you could control a fish and catch quite a few, but as soon as the seagulls turn up, that's the end of surface fishing. Whew, absolute one toner. Back on what I'd class as the banker rod that's done most of the bites, the one just sort of straight out, sort of three quarters of the way across. I've been sat down by my rods for ages, just popped back up to the bivvy just to, uh, well, if I'm honest, check my phone. It's been a while. And um, it absolutely ripped off. Bit of commotion hitting the rod, knocked the other one off the rest. It's one of them feelings you get a bite, it's all, it's all adrenaline, you just want to get it done. I'm slowly trying to edge my way back. I had to go out for him again because he went well left really, really quickly. But uh, he's being quite friendly now. He's just sort of, he's come round, going round to the right a little bit, but a little bit of side strain, as you can see, it's gonna tease him back round. No need to rush it. And we have, oh, got another one to show you. Get in. Well, there we go, fish number five and yet another beautiful scaly mirror. 
I'm beginning to believe there's absolutely no commons in this lake. You don't get many, many fisheries that have got such a good stock of scaly ones. However, on the plus side, on the, on the good side as well, this is the fifth bite, sorry, fifth fish, fourth bite I've had today. But more importantly, I've had bites on all rods and that just tells me that the rig changes we've made are definitely working. There we go, just redone the right hand rod. Now this is fished on the far margin, right under the canopy of a tree. Um, now, I had a sneaky way of getting it onto the spot. I did, you could cast it out, you could, and you'd get it there eventually, you know, you're using the line clip on your reel. But I wanted to make sure I got it under there really, really quickly and, and without making too much disturbance. So, take the rig off, and I've cast the lead actually onto the bank, onto the far margin. I've gone round there, I've found where it is, and then there was a little bit too much slack line out. So what I then tend to do is sort of put the lead into the tree so that it can't, can't fall out basically. You don't want to, don't want to go to all this effort and then add time to what you're doing. Come back round here, take all of the slack up so you've got a real tight line going straight to the tree. Give yourself, like loosen your clutch a little bit so if you need to pull a bit of line you can do. Once you get back round there, clip your rig back on. Now as you can see I'm wearing chest waders and it's quite important unless you want to get really wet. I can see the bottom from, from where I am so I know, you know, I know it's perfectly safe to get in. But I do just want to stress, I've got, there's a camera crew here today as well, so if I did get into any difficult, I've got plenty of people with me whilst I'm doing it. You won't always have that luxury, so please make sure you can either see the bottom, you can use a prodding stick to make sure if it's a bit murky, but just, you know, just be safe. Anyway, once I'm there, I know that I can get in, so I've, I've got into the water, and I can creep actually under the tree, and I can see the spot is glowing, it's a bit, you know, it's quite gravelly under there, and there's, you know, I've not found so much gravel. And I could see by just by lowering my hook bait down into position, I can get it all laid out nice and straight. I can see my little PVA stick melting and I know my hook's fresh. I can then just get out of my pouch and my waders, I can just put a few handfuls of bait around it. Not too much, because the carp are not usually expecting to get such a tight little bed of bait right under a tree like that. So they, they tend to be coming through there because they do anyway, and you can get some real, real quick bites. Anyway, get yourself back out, come back round, Make sure that once you've got your, you know, your bobbin set, you lock your clutch up because I'm fishing, as I've said, it's a canopy. If, the, if you give the fish too much line, you can end up losing it due to the snag. So it's all locked up, very, very small drop on the bobbin, and it's ready to go again. Fingers crossed. I've moved round onto the road bank on the Hardwick side of the lake, basically because there's so many fish here. I've flocked one rod out to the right, just over there. There's a big mass of bubbles coming up. I didn't cast right on top of it cast slightly to the right of it, pulled the lead back and felt it down and it felt reasonably okay. The rod on the right, again I've just chucked it out where I've seen some fish cruising, that was a bit softer but because I'm fishing helicopter rigs now and the top bead is moved up, the lead can go into the soft stuff which I'm guessing is weed and it leaves the little hinge stiff rig that I'm using presented perfectly on top. And the third and final rod is going just straight out in front of me there, about 20 yards out. There's been a lot of fish activity there. Um, this one's got a pink squid hook bait on it. I've got a mystic spice on one rod, and a, um, I think it's a garlic on the other rod, all of which I've had loads of bites on before. But just try with single hook baits to start off with and see how we go. I don't normally get to talk much, but we're coming towards end of day two, and Spoons have told me to do a bit to camera. Can't believe it. He's had a really good day in here. He's landed three carp. I know he's had a good day because I've had a bad one. Every time he gets one, he chucks me on the floor. Still, never mind, he's hoping to catch some more fruit now, but he's going to have to wait and see if the fish stay in here or not. I better not talk too long because he's already given me some evils. So it's good night from him. And good night from me. I'll see you in the morning.
Well, as everybody zooms off to work, I was into action on my right hand rod. What a lovely carp this is, 23 and a half pounds, well chuffed to get him. And he came just about an hour ago um, as the sun was coming up. It's a beautiful morning here on Hardwick and uh, the bite came on one of those garlic hook baits. So I'm putting a little bit of uh, garlic juice over the top of the bait, letting it soak in over a matter of months. And uh, they still absolutely stink even when they've been out there all night. Caught another one just after dark as well, just over the 10 pound barrier. That one was on a pink squid hook bait, but both have been on the uh, hinge stiff rig. It's working really well in the weed out there. There's weed absolutely everywhere. And all I did was just cast around with the lead a few more times. The fish started showing a bit further out. So I cast around and found an area that was just a bit clearer. 12 and a half rod length straight out in front of me and that's what's been doing the bite. So we're going to get him back. I'm going to stay here for another hour or so, but it's going to be the hottest day of the year this year, and I reckon they could end up getting round at the top end of Smith. So uh, we'll get him back, keep our eye on the fish's movements and see if we can catch another one. Well, it's taken a while, but the uh, the middle rod has roared off. 12 and a half rod length, straight out in front on a, a pink squid hinge stiff rig. So the move definitely, definitely paid off. Uh, three bites in 12 hours, pleased with that. These fish on uh, Hardwick Smiths are so nomadic. They really are temperature controlled. When it's cooler, they seem to be in this side, um, out in open water. And when it's hot, there's a lot more fish in the Smith side. Um, there he is. But the exception to that is this corner because it's shallower here and a lot weedier. And um, Simon Scott said to me in the past that um, basically as the sun comes up, the oxygen levels increase dramatically, the fish's activity increases, and that's why you get bites first thing in the morning. Just putting uh, four or five baits out at a time in the catapult. That's a good way of beating the goals. Get in my net. Come on, get in my net. Yes, got him. Wicked result. And there he is, just over 22 pounds. Proper chunky little one. And I reckon this one, rather than being a baby of Simon Scott, is a baby of Mark Simmons known for not having many scales on them, but growing really big. And this one's definitely got potential. So uh, we're gonna put him back, get the rod back out again, catapult a few more baits over the top and uh, stay here for a little while, I think, because the wind's pushing in now. It's not as hot as we were expecting and uh, it's crazy to move off a spot if you're getting bites on it. Give him a little kissy. Mwah. Thank you, my love, off you go. Well, pretty much the same as yesterday. There's been plenty of activity for a couple of hours now and sure enough, what has become the banker rod, the middle rod, has, has just roared off and yet again, powerfully surging straight towards that far side because I'm sitting down by my rods, I'm in my waders, I'm just straight in the water and on top of it, you know? Oh. I've had a couple of people in the swimming, I've been saying half tens of time, half tens of time, and when it came round, it didn't go, you're like, oh, here we go. But, 10 to 11, and they're just running a little bit late, it's not too bad. Looks slightly bigger than some of the others we've had. And, oh, <laughs> yeah, again, I thought it got out, but he's in the net, get in. Biggest fish of the trip so far, coming in at bang on 19 pound. I was beginning to think that all I had in front of me was just a group of mid-doubles, but this one is not far off the magical 20 pound mark. What a beautiful carp, a happy man. Well, I've just probably half an hour ago repositioned the left hand rod back in close because uh, there were so many fish showing down there. Um, same rig, hinge stiff rig, 
I've been catapulting some half boilies down there and uh, I had two vicious liners a minute ago and it's just roared off and properly roared off as well with this fella. With it being hot and sunny like this, um, whoa. You want to be in the shallowest water you can if you're fishing on the bottom and it's probably six or seven foot down there and by catapulting a lot of uh, freebies in I've sort of attracted them to feed when normally they wouldn't want to. Just see the little garlic pop up in his mouth. Get in that net, get in that net. Yes, got him! Wicked. Well, what a perfect little carp to end our session, taken uh, by moving a rod again. And uh, that's really what I've got from this, is that on this particular place, especially in the hot weather, you need to move around a lot to stay on the fish, or certainly I did. It didn't go according to plan. I thought I was going to be plotted up in one swim, and I've really had to work at it, but I've really enjoyed doing that. And uh, it's nice to work somewhere out and get a few results. Spoons, your first time on the lake. What, yep. what would you say you've learnt from it? I'll be honest, Dan, I, I expected to fish it the way you've ended up, sort of moving around, trying to nick a bite here and there. And I sort of got into a swim that offered offered that it was a little bay it was a few bubbles coming up so I didn't yep. fish the first night flicked some rigs out and had a couple of bites the first day nothing through the night and thought that's it they've done the off but gradually a few more bubbles popped up and they kept turning back so up they, and they kept turning up they again did, each yeah. day yeah right you know kept the rods out and you know carried on catching a few right. really really enjoyable right and if you came back would you go would you go back into the same area or what would no, you do I, th I think you, you've still got to find them i mean i had a little mooch around this morning and i found another area where they were clearly i think moving to yeah they've been less and less of turning up in my area right um, caught them all son haven't you caught them all Adam. <laughs> <laughs> i wish um but no i think i think the approach you've actually adopted is probably the, the perfect one for the lake i think i've yeah. just got i've got a bit fortunate in that they've they've stayed there I think under normal circumstances they'd have done the off early on and you'd have had to follow them to, mate, to always, I always put the guest in the dolly hole. Always. I like you're, to work you're it. You're a lovely bloke, mate, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all we've got time for in this session. Thanks very much for watching and we'll see you on the bank sometime.